Okay. All right. Welcome, everyone. I'm really excited to kick off the 2023 year of the Aspiring Scientists Coalition. Um, for those who, if that's your first time being here, the goal of the Aspiring Scientists Coalition is to connect students around the world with scientists who are doing the thing and doing it right and, uh, you know, bring them educational materials. Um, ideally, we would like scientists to come in and talk about their fields, talk about their research, speak about their experience, and just share tips for the next generation of scientists, because not always are those types of resources and materials and information available to everyone, especially globally. And so today, I am very excited to introduce our speaker, Kimberly Fiak. So Kimberly, you may know her as The Path PhD. Um, she has over 23,000 followers on Instagram, and she was also recognized by the Society for Neuroscience for uh, with the Next Generation Award for championing and promoting the field of pathology through social media. She did her bachelor's degree in neuroscience and psychology at UT Dallas before doing a, a master's in pathology at the University of Iowa, and she is now wrapping up her PhD in neuropathology also at Iowa, and we were just talking about the thesis writing process and how arduous and, and how much fun that is. Um, but Kimberly, thank you so much for being here. Uh, if folks have questions, just put them in the chat. I certainly will have questions at the end, but the goal of this is to really just help you understand um, this career path and, and what it looks like. So now's your time to ask an expert in this field about uh, what her experience has been and, and how you can potentially benefit from her, uh, what she's learned. So Kimberly, thank you so much. I'm gonna pin you. Yeah, of course. I'm so happy to be here. So I'll go ahead and oh can you enable screen sharing i don't know if you're the host yeah Let's i'll go ahead and start with some slides just to give you an overview of who i am and what i do um and then we can chit chat after that so oh okay can you see slides beautiful Yay! okay <laughs> so hello everyone as ben just said i'm kimberly fiak i am a phd candidate in experimental pathology at the university of iowa I am in my last semester, I am writing my thesis, I am finishing this year, I am graduating, and I am moving on. Because um, I've done five years of grad school and that's a lot. So, and I'm sure other people have done even more years of grad school and that's mad props to them because five years has been enough for me. Um, but I'm really excited to talk to you today about neuropathology. Um, I like to call it becoming a brain detective because it really uses a lot of the same skills as detective work, but in the context of your brain or any other organ system. Um, so we're really gonna focus today on neuropathology, which is the study of brain diseases, but recognize that a lot of these um, ideas and concepts that we're talking about can apply to other types of diseases as well. So the field of pathology as a whole, the study of disease, um, every organ system has its own pathology. Um, so you have cardiac pathology, you know, you have lung pathology, you have ob guying pathology, you know, you have all sorts of things, um, pediatric pathology, and so on and so forth. Um, so we're going to talk mostly today about neuropath, but these things can apply to other areas. So if you're interested in things besides the brain, um, pathology still could be the career for you, just a, a different sect of pathology. And so a little bit about me. Um, so what do I do? Like I said, I'm a scientist. I study neuropathology. So neuro, brains and nerves, pathology, the study of disease. Um, how did I get here? Oh, well, it was a long road. Also, this I have three cats, um, so they may make some appearances every once in a while. Perks of working from home, but also downsides of working from home. Um, so I apologize in advance. Oh, okay. No, we're not going to do that um, if they get in the way. Uh, so anyways, back to how I got here. So uh, like Ben said, I got a Bachelor of Science in Neuroscience and Psychology from UT Dallas. I actually um, was born in California, raised in Arizona, and then decided I wanted to go out of state. So I picked Texas, never had been to Texas before, but I was like, Texas sounds interesting. It's in the South, so it's kind of close to what I'm used to growing up in Arizona. And I went to UT Dallas, which is in Richardson. That's a suburb of Dallas. And then after that, I was like, I wanna leave Dallas. So I started applying for master's degrees. Um, I wanted to pursue a PhD in graduate school, but I struggled a lot with my mental health in undergrad. I have bipolar disorder um, and OCD. And so that made doing undergrad very challenging. Um, so my grade point average wasn't that great. I had a lot of extracurriculars 
Um, I had a lot of research experience, but my grades had suffered um, significantly because of my mental health. And so I was told by many, many people that a PhD wasn't for me. I was never going to make it. Um, I would never get in. I didn't have the grades. They didn't believe in me, whatever else. And so I decided to pursue a master's degree first to see if I could handle graduate school and to kind of figure out whether or not this really was the career for me. I'd always wanted to be a scientist, but so many people had told me that it just wasn't going to happen for me, that I started to really question whether or not they were right. So I um, applied to a couple different master's programs in pathology. Now, the reason I switched from neuroscience to pathology was that I was always really interested in disease. And then I got interested in diseases in the context of neuroscience. Um, but my main love or focus has always really been pathology rather than neuroscience. And so I chose to pursue a pathology degree to give me more in-depth knowledge about how disease works in all contexts, and then apply my neuroscience knowledge from undergrad to that to kind of marry those two ideas. Um, so luckily, University of Iowa, um, accepted me to their master's program. It's, it was fully funded, which is incredible. Most master's programs are not, so I was very fortunate. And I did that for two years and graduated in 2020. I defended my thesis in the middle of the pandemic. Um, this was like summer 2020 when we still had no idea what was going on. Like we were in lockdown. It was a whole um, thing to write my thesis in lockdown and then defend. Um, but I decided I still wanted to do a PhD. And luckily my, um, program director came to me and was like, hey, we're starting this brand new PhD program in our department. Do you want to join? And I was like, yes, I would love to. So I kind of just switched into the PhD mode after I graduated, stayed in the same lab, um, and then changed the focus of my project to start something new because I couldn't use any of my master's work towards my PhD, which was fine. Um, so I've been doing that since 2020. So about three years, like I said, in my final semester, um, and I'm very excited to be done. <laughs> so I talked a lot about pathology. I said it's the study of disease, but like, what does that really mean? Um, so it's really an art. It's art mixed with science. Um, and this can be kind of a tricky, hard thing to talk about because disease is very sad and people having diseases is very sad. And the way that these things affect people, their lives, their loved ones um, is all very sad. But there's also a lot of beauty in pathology um, and the way that we can give people answers that many other fields cannot is something that's beautiful. Um, a lot of other fields make subjective guesses based on the, the information they have. Um, but in pathology, we really give definitive answers that are based on what we see in your tissue. There's no there's no lying. Your, your tissue doesn't lie. Um, the pathology doesn't lie. It is what it is. Whereas you can interpret things in other fields in different contexts that can change um, your perception of what's going on. But pathology is very straightforward. It is what it is, which is one of the things that I love most about it. Um, so it's really the art and science of diagnosing disease based on examination of samples from patients. Now, these can be living or deceased patients. Um, so a lot of people think about pathology, like forensic pathology, like establishing cause of death, um, or um, they think about, you know, autopsy pathology, which is after people die, which is a huge and important part of pathology. But pathology is also critical for living patients. So anytime you go to the doctor and you have a throat test for strep, or you have a PCR test for COVID, or you have a biopsy taken to determine whether or not something's cancerous. All of that goes through the pathology department um, to give you answers. So it's really critical patient care um, and pathologists are very important part of patient care despite not always being patient facing. Um, and so these are just examples of different types of pathology. So this one is one of my favorite images. This is an astrocyte in human brain um, and ATA is a stain for a tau. That's a protein that I study in my lab that's important in development and disease. Um, and so this is a, I think this is an Alzheimer's disease case that shows um, an astrocyte and some tau pathology and then tau mRNA. So this is probably a neuron showing this tau mRNA. So just something cool. So you can see we have lots of different colors. We also have an IBA1 stain here, um, which is 
marking for microglia, which are a type of immune system cell in the brain, and then an H&E, which is your most common stain, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit, that just shows cellular morphology. We can actually see here, this is a Lewy body, which you would find in Parkinson's disease and Lewy body dementia. All things we'll, we'll chat about a little bit later on. Um, also, if you ask questions in the chat, I won't be able to read it while I'm doing this. Um, so Ben, if you can tell me if there are any questions in the chat, that would be great so I can answer them. Yeah, Kim Kimberly, if you don't mind, there is a question yes. that um, yes. someone asked, how do you get brain samples from living patients? Excellent question. Um, so you can actually do a brain biopsy. Um, so if you have a mass, and this is something we'll talk about later too when I show you an example, if you have a mass or a lesion on like an MRI or some kind of scan that the neurosurgeons think is potentially cancerous, they can take a biopsy. They have this long tool that is hollow in the middle. Um, we call it a core. And so they will literally take a small like punch almost of that mass and then send it off to pathology where we can um, slice it and stain it to see what the cells look like in that area. So it's, um, if you've ever had a skin punch, I don't know if that's a common experience. I've had one for research, but um, it's basically like a small piece of the tissue that they take out. Um, and that usually only happens if they suspect cancer or some kind of lesion that needs treatment. Um, for neurodegenerative diseases, they don't take biopsies because you'd have to biopsy every area of the brain in order to determine the pathology. Um, and I can talk more about that, but um, that's specifically for people that have like lesions on MRIs. Awesome. Okay. So what kind of things can we look at in pathology? And I just touched on a lot of them. Um, so the most common thing that people probably think of is degenerative diseases. So Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, um, Lewy body dementia, frontotemporal lobar degeneration, um, all of that falls under degenerative disease. And a lot of people kind of can associate that with pathology. And then we have tumors. Um, so a lot of people can also associate that. So different types of brain cancer. Um, this is actually a really interesting picture. So this is a picture of a tumor called a teratoma. This is a germ cell tumor. So typically originates from the testes or ovaries. And what's really interesting in that teratomas possess pluripotent properties because they're germ cell tumors, which means that they can actually form other types of tissues within the tumor itself. Um, so this shows you like lung epithelia um, that this tumor has, but you can have a tumor that has brain matter. You can have a tumor that has teeth, that has hair. Um, it's kind of gross, but kind of also very interesting because of that pluripotency property. Um, so if you're interested, look that up after this. It's called a teratoma. So um, these are the big broad categories that most people can kind of associate. But there are a lot of other things we can look at in neuropathology that people don't think about. So parasites, for example. Um, so there are a lot of parasites that you can um, get that are like intestinal or that are in some other organ system that can actually travel into the brain and cause disease. Um, so this is an example of a parasite. It's called, um, this disease is called schistosomiasis. So this is actually, I believe um, you can get this from freshwater or undercooked pork. I can't remember exactly which one, um, but essentially it's a parasite that can get into your brain and cause a lot of neurological problems. Um, we also have viruses. So, you know, we're thinking about COVID-19, we're seeing a lot of impacts on long COVID um, and we are seeing some changes to brain. Um, I'm not totally up on the COVID pathology literature, so I won't speak to that, but there are a lot of other viruses that we know can impact the brain. Um, so this is an image of the JC virus, which causes a disease called PML, which is progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. Um, so this is a disease that we commonly see in elderly individuals and immunocompromised individuals. Um, the JC virus is a normal virus that a lot of us will come in contact with in our life that won't affect us, um, but particularly immunocompromised patients, either from HIV or organ transplants, and we're now seeing a lot in elderly patients. They can have um, problems with this JC virus, which causes PML. And then finally, oop, traumatic brain injury. Um, this is something that a lot of people don't like to talk about, um, traumatic injuries from accidents, from abuse, from sports. A lot of these are things that we don't like to think about, but this is an important part of pathology um, and being able to diagnose and effectively treat injuries requires knowing, again, what type of injury is there. Um, and so this is an example of a germinal matrix hemorrhage. 
Um, so fetal brains um, can be particularly susceptible to hemorrhages. Um, my boss is specializes in pediatric neuropathology. And so I've seen a lot of different types of neuropathology that can affect um, all different stages of development in children, teenagers, adults, and all the way on. Um, so it's a hard job, but it's an important job because people want answers. Um, and so these are all essentially different types of categories that we can look at. And there are others too. You can have ocular pathology that's part of neuropath. You can have muscle path. There's lots of different things. So this is just to show you that it's a very broad field. So if you're not interested in degenerative diseases, that's okay. Um, there's lots of other things you can study within neuropath. Do we have a question? I think I see a thing. Yes. And it's a bit of a large question. So I hope you're ready. Okay. Okay. Yes. Ready. All right, which neurological and neuropsychiatric conditions have well-established disease pathologies and which lesser studied pathologies are you looking forward to in the coming years? Okay, that's a really interesting question. Um, and so interestingly, as far as I know, there's not a lot of a pathologic correlate to these diseases, um, particularly with neuropsychiatric conditions. Um, these tend to be, at least from my understanding, um, more deficits in like signaling um, and the way that neurons communicate with each other and areas of the brain communicate with each other rather than like deposition of a protein or something like that. Now, I know there is some literature to suggest that the um, architecture or like structure of um, areas like the amygdala, um, the hippocampus can be changed or be different in different psychiatric conditions. Um, but we don't really look at neuropsychiatric conditions in my field simply because there's not a lot of physical pathology. It's a lot more to do with the way that um, areas of the brain, excuse me, talk to each other and communicate and the way that neurons are shaped and things like that, which is a little more basic neuroscience and a little less neuropathology. And then the second question was, what diseases am I looking forward to? Um, the question was, which lesser studied pathologies are you looking forward to in the upcoming years? Oh, that's excellent. So my research, which I'll talk about at the very end, is actually focused on frontotemporal lobe bar degeneration with tau or FTLD tau. Um, Bruce Willis was in the news recently with a diagnosis of FTD, frontotemporal dementia. That's a clinical term used to categorize diseases based on symptoms, which correlates with a bunch of different pathologic diseases called frontotemporal lobar degeneration. And so these are more rare diseases that aren't really well studied. Um, a lot of people in the neurodegenerative space study Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease or vascular dementia, because those are kind of the top more common ones. Um, but frontotemporal lobar degeneration is actually the most common cause of dementia in individuals under the age of 60. So they're not as well studied. Um, I'm trying to do my part to study them. I hope more people will too, especially with the buzz created by um, Bruce Willis's um, family uh, talking about their story and a lot of other people who have frontotemporal dementia coming out and talking about their story as well. Um, so those are kind of more understudied diseases that I hope we get, you know, more uh, buzz going about. There is another question. Would yes. you like another one? Yeah, of course. What are some of the techniques other than imaging that pathologists use? And are pathologists primarily working with human tissues? Excellent question. So it really depends on the type of pathologist. Um, so in my space and the people that I work with, they're all human pathologists because I work you know, I work at a university that's attached to a hospital. Um, so that's all patient samples. But there are veterinary pathologists whose job it is to diagnose your diseases in pets. So if you think about if your pet gets ringworm, heartworm, um, they get a virus, anything like that, there's a, a veterinary pathologist that looks at that sample and tells you what it is. Um, so you don't have to work with human tissue in order to work in pathology. And then techniques and things. So imaging is a big one. Microscopy is a huge one because that's how we look at disease. Um, but in the lab, I do a lot of other things that aren't tissue based. Um, so I do a lot of work in cultured cells, um, specifically with stem cells, which I can turn into other types of cells that I may be interested in studying. In my case, astrocytes, but also you can study neurons. You can study um, microglia. There are lots of other types of cells that are outside of the brain that you can study as well. And so that's a big way to model disease. Um, and then the other category of people 
in like the lab space tend to use animal models. Um, so the most common ones would be like mouse models and Drosophila or fly models. Um, there are some labs that use marmosets or um, like a monkey model. Um, those are really costly to keep up um, and hard to work with. So not as many labs. Um, and then pigs are really common for like traumatic brain injury models. And I think that's probably like the main ones. Um, so there's a lot of wet bench work that goes into it besides just besides microscopy and staining um, that you can use to study pathology as well. Awesome. These are really great questions. Okay, so actually that kind of really leads well into my next um, slide, which is the types of pathology. And so the first one is anatomic pathology. This is kind of the one that everyone is maybe familiar with. So this is diagnosing um, disease based on tissue or whole bodies grossly or under the microscope. Um, so I always tell people that like gross pathology doesn't mean gross like you. Gross means like macroscopic, which is a terrible name. I don't know why they did that. Uh, but gross means macroscopic. So looking at something without a microscope and looking at the pathology. And there's a lot of pathology we can see um, macroscopically, uh, particularly with traumatic brain injuries and then um, neurodegenerative diseases. And so um, under this category of neuropathology, which is what I've talked a lot about, surgical pathology. So any of the biopsies that they take um, during surgery would go under anatomic pathology, forensic pathology. Um, so again, medical legal purposes, diagnosing diseases or cause of death in individuals that have died. And then um, histopathology, which is microscopic pathology, which can fit under all of those categories. But we also have clinical pathology, which is very different. Um, so this is based on laboratory testing of usually liquid samples. So things like blood, urine, saliva. So your tox screens, like if you're looking for different toxins or drugs in a system, that's under clinical pathology. If you're looking for strep or other types of bacterial infections, that's under clinical pathology. Viral infections are clinical pathology. Um, so that's a whole separate part of pathology that has nothing to do with tissue and has everything to do with other types of samples. Do we have another question? No, we're good. Okay, cool. And then, um, the, oh, and, and clinical pathology is also known as laboratory medicine. So if you're interested in that, if that sounds more up your alley than tissue, um, you can also find jobs in laboratory medicine. That's the same kind of concept. And then finally, we have molecular pathology, which I think is the least well-known type of pathology. Um, and this is making diagnoses based on genetic testing. So if you've ever heard of like, um, like a whole genome sequencing, um, if they're looking for specific disease causing mutations that we either know of for sure or are potentially or likely pathogenic, um, that's all done through molecular pathology. And this interacts a lot with anatomic pathology actually because um, a lot of, in my case, brain tumors, um, but I'm sure tumors in other organs as well, have specific genetic markers that help you determine the, the grade of the tumor. Um, so when we think about staging of tumors, that is not that's other organs that aren't the brain. Um, so a lot of people will be like, what's the stage of the brain cancer? But it's not based on staging. It's called grading. Um, it's slightly different based on the types of, um, basically the, the tumor has these figures that are called METs. Um, they're like mitotic figures. They're essentially like how much the tumor is dividing and growing. And so tumors are graded based on that and not stage, um, which is based on metastases. So like how far has the pathology spread? Brain tumors don't really spread. They stay in the brain. Whereas other types of tumors, lung cancer, um, you know, liver, GI, whatever, those can spread. And so that's staging. And so molecular pathology helps a lot with grading of tumors. Um, so all three of these can interact. Yes, question. I have a question. Yes. So you talked about this, the way that tumors in the brain are graded. So it sounds like a higher grade tumor would be generally like more dangerous or unpredictable because it's uh, dividing more quickly. Is that right? Yeah. So it's more aggressive. Um, and so depending on the grade, um, and if there's a whole gigantic, it's probably like a thousand page book on like the new who classifications for grading. So I definitely don't know all of it, but essentially, yeah, it's about like the aggressiveness of the tumor. Um, and it also depends on the type of brain tumor, because as I'll talk about later, there are different types. Um, most people don't know that they think of just brain cancer, um, but there are different types that affect you can have neuronal based tumors, you can have glial based tumors, you can have 
tumors of the dura, of the meninges, which is the covering of the brain. And so all of those have different, um, basically things that they use to determine like the severity of the tumor and prognosis and those kinds of things. And some of that is based on the molecular signatures. So then would the grading then determine the, um, the clinical approach that would be used, like the treatment approach? I think it can. Yeah. I think it can definitely guide it. Um, especially if there are tumors that have specific gene mutations. Um, when you start thinking about like targeted therapeutics, so a lot of that kind of like gene therapy for targeting cancers, I don't know how much of that has moved into the neuroscience space. I know that's for a lot of other types of, of tumors in the brain, um, but that would be really important knowing the, the molecular signatures in order to determine kind of gene therapies and things if that, if we get there at some point. Yeah. Um, thank you for answering my question. We have another one that just came in, yeah, of um, course. which I'm not sure. The question is, can chronic stress cause brain tumors? That's a good question. I have no idea. Um, and I'll be honest. So I don't study tumors. Uh, so I have no idea. I know chronic stress can have problems. I think it can cause inflammation. Do not quote me on that because I do not know the literature in this space. I think there's some research that suggests it can cause neuroinflammation, but I do not know. Um, so the answer is, I don't know if it can cause tumors. Um, okay. You want another question? One just came sure. in. Yes. All right. Um, I worked, this is not from me. This is from uh, someone else I asked. I worked on in silico approach of identifying biomarkers of neurodegenerative disorders. So does this work fall under neuropathology? Yes, it can. Um, there are a couple labs that I know of that look at biomarkers um, that are specifically led by uh, PhD trained neuropathologists. Um, Dr. Melissa Murray at Mayo Clinic Florida um, is one that comes to mind. She's really interested in biomarkers and neurodegenerative diseases, and she works as a PhD trained neuropathologist. Um, so that definitely does fall under the, the heading of neuropath. Anytime you're looking at diseases affecting the brain, that would fall under, which interestingly, a lot of neuroscience researchers don't realize or don't consider their work part of neuropath. But if you're studying a disease, even if you're focused on the really cellular and molecular components of the disease, um, it can also fall under neuropathology simply because neuropathology is broadly the study of disease. So all of those little bits do. Um, maybe they wouldn't call themselves neuropathologists because they don't have the specific neuropathology training, but they could at least say that their work is relevant to neuropathology, um, which I don't think a lot of people realize. Awesome. Okay. Moving right along. So careers in neuropathology. Um, so the big one is a pathologist. Um, I've kind of talked a lot about this. These are the people who are diagnosing diseases in patients. Um, Typically, MD train, these are MD trained, so MD or DO, have a medical degree. They do uh, you know, four years of med school, then four years of training in pathology, either anatomic pathology or clinical pathology or both. So you have AP, CP, or APCP. So depending on what you're interested in long term, you can either focus on anatomic clinical, or you can do both um, for your residency. And then a lot of pathologists will subspecialize, so do a fellowship in a specific specialty. So in this case, it'd be neuropathology. Um, forensic pathology is actually another area that um, a lot of forensic pathologists will co-specialize in either neuropathology or cardiac pathology. Um, so if you're interested in forensics and neuropath, there's definitely um, a lot of, of places for you to go. And there's a lot of people that, that do that as well. Um, those are two that just happen to fit really well together. We also, oh, and then under that, we have this rare category of people like me, um, which are called PhD trained neuropathologists. So these are people who are not medical doctors. So we can't legally diagnose disease in patients. So like I cannot sign out a tumor or anything like that. Um, but we play a critical role in keeping brain tissue repositories up and running. Um, there are not very many pathologists, specifically neuropathologists across the country. It's a very small field. Um, and so having PhD trained neuropathologists helps keep brain banks running. We can do all of the work to diagnose a disease in a, a donated brain and then have an MD trained pathologist who has a medical license sign off on that death certificate or sign off on that disease um, process. So we work very much in tandem, um, but there are very few of us and we need more people. So if you're interested in this, PhD trained neuropathologists are really vital and there are not a lot of them. Um, so it's definitely an interesting pathway and we can certainly talk more about that um, in the future. 
Then you have um, another, another type of um, lab career that's not necessarily specific to pathology, uh, neuropathology, but is called a pathologist assistant. And this is a master's degree. Um, so it's a like a specific career track called for pathologist assistant. They're called PAs, which can be confusing with physician assistant. Um, but essentially what they do is they prepare and gross all of the specimens for the pathologist. So they prepare any specimen that gets sent to the pathology department. They're the ones who are preparing it. They, you know, take notes and dictate all of the findings that they've seen grossly. They, you know, put it in cassettes for histology to process, um, you know, analyzing margins and orientation and things like that. So super interesting career. Again, not limited to neuropathology, but if you're really interested in just lots of different organs and want to get exposure to lots of different types of things, pathologist assistance is a great defined career track. Um, they're pretty well paid from what I know, and they're very, they're in high demand. Um, there are a lot of people that want and need them, and there aren't as many people in that career path. So if you're interested in, that's like a great career track to get into. Um, we also have scientists. So again, people like me, um, these can be any, any level, bachelor's degree, master's degree, PhD, with an MD, without an MD, you know, all sorts of combinations. And these are the people that are working in a research lab to understand kind of um, how a disease manifests, the causes and consequences, and then looking into therapeutics. Um, so again, this is more basic science. It's less diagnosing of diseases and more like understanding how diseases work. And then finally, we have medical laboratory technicians. So I talked about clinical pathology. Um, these are really important um, individuals that help process all those specimens. So if you're really interested in microbiology or you're interested in um, like toxicology or things like that, medical laboratory scientists are the ones that are doing the testing in these clinical labs. Um, and then there's also histotechnologists or like histotechnicians, which are the ones that are doing like the processing of tissues, cutting of slides, staining, all that kind of stuff. Um, so that can also be within a clinical context, or you can do that within a research context. And I see a lot of chats. So I feel like there are a lot of questions. Um, another question came in about brain tumors. Um, yeah. And I responded to it, which is why there are a few messages. So. Okay. Uh, someone asked, can a brain tumor be healed without medication or surgery? Any chance it will go away on its own? Um, I don't, I don't know. I think it would really, really, really depend on the type of tumor. And like I said, I don't study tumors. So I'm going to go with, I don't know for sure on that, on that answer. Yeah. I would think it would be very unlikely to just go away on its own, but yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure there have been reported cases of that. However, it would have to be a really special circumstance, a really specific type of tumor. Um, so yeah, I would agree. It's probably unlikely, but again, I won't comment with a definitive answer for sure. Yeah. Can I ask you a question? You're yeah. As you're talking about careers and um, that there's a uh, shortage of pathologists and pathology trained people, um, are, are there a lot of pathology programs out there or are there only a few? Are there some that you recommend? Yeah, so that's a really great question. Obviously, I recommend my program at the University of Iowa. Um, I think they gave me excellent training. Um, there are a lot of pathology PhD programs. I have a reel on my Instagram account that's like 10 universities with pathology PhD programs that that would just give you kind of an idea of places to look. Um, if you're interested in pursuing a PhD, sometimes they're called experimental pathology. Sometimes it's just called pathology. So try Googling both. Um, but there are a lot of programs. Now, I will say most of these programs are have like a heavy immunology focus. Immunology is part of pathology. Um, and so a lot of um, people focus on immunology within the context of pathology. So for kind of background context, there's, I want to say like 10 to 12 people in both the master's and PhD pathology program at my university. And one person does heart, so cardiac pathology. I do neuropathology. And then most everyone else does immunology stuff. Um, and so it's going to be really rare and harder to find 
um, an opportunity to train at a pathology program in neuropathology if you're interested in being a PhD trained neuropathologist. However, if you go to a university that has a pathology program that has a brain bank, you will have more opportunities um, if you can work with the brain bank, that is really where I learned a lot of my neuropathology skills. Or if you say, I'm really interested in learning neuropathology, can I shadow pathologists in the department? Um, you may have opportunities to learn outside the classroom. But most of my learning for my neuropathology was done outside the classroom. I had a little bit in class, I was exposed to it, but if you really want to make that into a career, you definitely have to find your own opportunities at brain banks um, and things like that. And what you were, were talking about with shortages is actually really important for other areas of neuroscience too. Um, anytime you have a lab that's using an animal model or wants to use human tissue that's never done it before, somebody has to be there to consult with them. And so you have, like in my, my university, for example, there's one neuropathologist in our department that also runs a research lab. And so anybody who wants to learn how to use or use human tissue or have questions about neuropathology, pathology in their research comes to him. So you have one person for an entire university consulting, and I'm trying to help with that, you know, as I graduate and be able to take that over. But fundamentally, there are universities where there are no neuropathologists or people don't have access to it. And so um, they're in really high demand because every other area of neuroscience needs a neuropathologist to help with their research. So just something to consider. Um, very Thank yes. you for mentioning that. And I just put into the chat the link to that reel with the 10 universities. Perfect. Yeah. So I, like I said, in the, the caveats of the reel, I can't speak to the quality of any of the programs because I didn't be, I wasn't in them myself. Um, but that was just to give you an idea of places to start looking for programs. Cool. So we talked a little bit about terminology. So let's touch a little bit more. Um, again, we talked about gross pathology, which is macroscopic. So this is a picture of an Alzheimer's disease brain. And I can tell that right away because of the gross pathology. So we have enlarged ventricles, um, which is a sign of atrophy, which is caused by neurons dying in the tissue shrinking. So this is very common in neurodegenerative processes, particularly Alzheimer's disease. Um, we can see some atrophy out here in the cortex. These spaces are a little bit large. Um, so this right away, I can look at the gross pathology and tell you there's a disease going on simply by context clues here. We also have um, histopathology or microscopic pathology. So I would then take sections of this tissue and look at it in the microscope and then determine which proteins are present to make a diagnosis. So these really go hand in hand. Um, and this is a picture of an astrocyte, probably um, a reactive astrocyte or an astrocyte responding to disease, just based on how dense it is, the, the branching and things like that. So all of that I can tell just by looking at these two images, I can tell there was a neurodegenerative disease going on, most likely Alzheimer's disease based on enlarged ventricles, definitely a reactive process going on, maybe some neuroinflammation just by these two images, which I think is really cool. Um, and then within histopathology, we have different types of staining techniques that we use to come to the, the, the pathology conclusions. Um, so the first one I mentioned earlier is an H&E. Um, so this is hematoxylin and eosin. So hematoxylin binds to DNA and stains it blue. Um, so this is used as a nuclear marker. Usually the nucleus has the DNA, and so that makes it blue. Um, so we can see where nuclei are, and we can tell different types of cells based on the size of their nucleus and the density or intensity of the staining. Um, so oligodendrocytes, for example, have a lot of chromatin. That's what hematoxylin binds to within the nucleus. Um, and so they stain really dark, whereas neurons do not have as much chromatin, so they stain lighter. Um, and neurons have much larger nuclei than, neuro, um, than astrocytes or oligodendrocytes. So you can use a lot of context clues from that. And then we pair this with eosin, which stains um, the cytoplasm, it stains proteins pink. And so basically all the rest of the, the tissue architecture is pink. And so we can tell kind of what cells look like or the morphology of cells based on this stain. And this is really important when we're talking about tumors. If the cells don't look right, you can tell that on an H&E. Um, you can tell morphologically they don't look the way normal brain cells should. So this is a very important technique, both clinically and in research. We also have special stains. Um, so these are different than IHC or immunohistochemistry, which is most people know about. Special stains don't use antibodies. They use specific staining 
processes and reagents to stain different things. So this is an example of an LFB, Luxol Fast Blue, the stains myelin. Um, so it stains myelin blue. And so this is a picture of um, an area of a brain that's it's white matter. Um, so that's where my, a lot of the myelinated axons are in the brain. So we can see there's these like blue fibrily looking things. Those are axons covered in myelin. Um, so this uses special reagents that stain this blue. There are other types of special stains um, that can be used. Congo red or thioflavin S, look for amyloids. Those can be used diagnostically. Um, there are um, like a PAS stain period. Uh, I think it's periodic acid. And I don't know exactly what PAS stands for, so I'm not going to butcher it. But anyways, PAS is another type of stain that you can use. There's a lot of them. Um, and then we have immunohistochemistry, which uses antibodies that recognize specific proteins. Um, and then we pair that with a chromogen that interacts with that primary antibody to produce a pigment. And so the most common one that's used is DAB or DAB. This produces a brown chromogen. Um, so this is an IHC of an astrocyte that has tau protein in it. This is what I study in, in my research lab. And so you can see the brown staining here is where all the tau pathology is um, or the tau protein. And we can use these for all sorts of things. So up here, this is GFAP. This marks astrocytes. So this is also immunohistochemistry, um, which is showing a different protein of interest. Um, in this case, GFAP versus tau. But all of these things together, they all work together to um, basically tell us what's going on in the tissue. What disease process is happening? Yes, question. Yeah, we have a few questions. Yeah. Um, Ooh, Lots of questions. Okay, I'll start with this one because it's relevant to, you were just talking about tau. Uh -huh. um, have you or any of your colleagues, and this is from our resident uh, chemistry fella, <laughs> have, you, have you or any of your colleagues done studies regarding the effects of later transition yeah. metal complexes on tau aggregation? I'm only vaguely aware of earlier metals like iron and their roles. I'm going to say no. I, um, I have never looked at that. Um, I don't know anyone who's looked at that, but a lot of the research that I do um, is more focused on tau in as a, a microtubule binding protein um, and then tau in the context of disease just in and of itself and the processes it triggers with tau deposition rather than looking at metals. So unfortunately, then my answer is no, um, but that sounds really interesting. Um, let's see. I have a question yeah. that I'm genuinely curious about, and I'm hoping that you have the answer. So you, at the top left, you showed this Alzheimer's brain yeah. and you talk about how the ventricles are enlarged and the, uh, the cortical folds are, you know, sunken in. Right. And so it's very easy to see to the trained eye, um, this like atrophy occurring at the surfaces of the brain, right? It's occurring in the inner surface and the outer surface. And my question is, are those areas just more vulnerable or are, is it actually that the atrophy is occurring throughout the brain and those are just where you can see it visibly? Um, so as always, my answer is going to say it depends. And so these areas, the areas that you most commonly see atrophy are enlargement of the ventricles due to atrophy of the surrounding cortical tissue, um, atrophy in particularly the sulci, so expanding the, um, so the, the gyrus or the, the cortical ribbon is atrophies, and so then the sulcus expands, um, and then the hippocampus is usually very vulnerable to atrophy, and all of that is due to pathology. Um, so depending on the severity of the Alzheimer's pathology, not the severity of the symptoms, but the severity of the pathology, that can really dictate where you see a lot of atrophy. Um, so in particularly severe Alzheimer's cases, you'll see a lot of cortical atrophy, you'll see hippocampal atrophy, you'll see ventricle enlargement. In more mild cases or moderate cases, you may not see all of those things. Um, that doesn't mean there's not pathology there, it's just, it's usually correlated with the amount, particularly of tau pathology um, that you have in those regions. So there is vulnerability in that those are the regions that tend to be most commonly affected by pathology, um, but it's all really dependent on how severe the pathology is, the, the microscopic pathology anyway. Cool. Um, yeah. Thank you. And we have one more question here. Yeah. Uh, which one would be better, studying a PhD in neuroscience at a university or at a medical center slash college? 
Ooh, that's really hard. Um, I think it would really just depend on the opportunities you have in, if we're talking about to learn pathology, um, I think it would really just depend on the opportunities to interact with neuropathologists because there are lots of universities that have brain banks or Alzheimer's disease research centers, ADRCs, um, or they have a Parkinson's disease equivalent, which I don't remember the acronym for, um, that you would potentially have opportunities to learn neuropathology that would be at institutions, not hospitals. Um, so I think it would really, really just depend on who you have access to, to learn from at one or the other institute. I'm sorry, I feel like every answer I give is it depends. I feel like that's very much a scientist thing to say. Everything depends. It's all context dependent. That's science, yeah. It okay. is. <laughs> um, okay, so we'll just talk a little bit about some examples of these things. I'll kind of go through this a bit more quickly just so I have time to answer more questions. Um, but let's just talk a little bit about what does, you know, microscopic histology, so what do neurons even look like? Um, most people are used to neurons on paper, which have these beautiful nuclei, um, and they have a beautiful cell body or soma. They have beautiful dendrites and a perfect axon with a myelin sheath around it, and they have perfect um, synaptic terminals and synaptic gaps and all that stuff, and they look gorgeous. Um, <laughs> In practice, neurons don't really look that perfect. Um, they do have all those same components, but they don't really look like that in tissue. Um, and the reason is that we usually look at tissue in very, very, very thin sections. Um, so typically we use five microns, which is really small. And neurons are huge and they have huge processes and they're very branched and they're large. And so they span way more than five microns. And so you really don't see all of that architecture in one section, unless you do a really thick section, which a lot of people do. Um, but these are examples of neurons. So these are actually anterior horn spinal cord neurons. So they're really big. Um, and you can see here that we have some dendritic branching. You have a soma. The axon's probably not in this plane of field because again, it's too small. But you can see these are huge. And so these are probably some of the largest neurons that you can see on h &E. Most of the time, they're not that big. Um, but you can do special stains if you want to look at the rest of that architecture. So this is a silver stain. Um, this was a used to be a very common technique. Now it's not as common because it's very uh, time and time intensive. It's laborious. It requires a lot of specialized reagents. Um, but this uses a, a thicker tissue to highlight architecture with silver, um, with a silver stain. And so you can see here, like here's an axon. This is a cell body. You can see dendrites. You can see a lot more architecture here. But again, you're using much thicker tissue. I think it's like 50 to 100 microns. So much thicker. Um, we can also look at astrocytes. So a lot of people are interested in neurons because they are kind of the, the poster child for neuroscience, but there are other brain cells that are equally as important and in fact are found in higher levels or quantities in the brain than neurons. So astrocytes, for example, I think the ratio is like three to one, don't quote me on that. Um, but astrocytes are way more common in the brain than neurons are. Um, and these are helper cells that are responsible for maintaining the blood brain barrier, repairing tissue, they provide nutrients to neurons amongst their many functions. Um, and so we can look at these with GFAP. This is actually pig brain. So you can see the astrocytes in pig brain um, compared with this is human brain. This is an astrocyte. Um, this is a picture I took of an astrocyte in human brain. Um, so same protein, two different staining methods. So this is with immunohistochemistry. This is with immunofluorescence, which uses fluorescent secondaries to visualize your protein instead of a chromogen. Um, but you can see very different um, cellular morphology. And then we have um, microglia, which are immune system cells that clear out infection, they remove dead cells, and they really protect the brain. And so IBA1 is a macrophage marker, microglia are a type of macrophage. And so IBA1 can be used to look at macrophages in other um, organs as well, but it works really well in the brain. And so microglia have kind of two states. They have this resting state where they're kind of small and they have a little bit of branching, and then they have an activated state. So when they're, ooh, is that glitching out for you? I'm so sorry. Oh, okay, good. Cool. I have a second monitor, but it's kind of touchy. Um, so activated microglia are responding to infection. And when they do that, you can see they have all these big branch processes. They're much larger. And that's um, kind of this activated state where they're responding to some kind of infection or inflammation or something like that. So we can tell if there's something going on in the tissue simply by looking at what state do the microglia look like they're in, um, which is pretty cool. 
And then finally we have oligodendrocytes. Unfortunately, I don't have my own pictures of oligodendrocytes. I need to get a stain validated so I can provide it in a picture. But essentially these are responsible for making the myelin sheath, which is the covering of the neurons axon. Um, and they also have branched processes. They actually have these cute little end feet that wrap around um, the neuron when they're, they're building the myelin sheath. And this is um, from a paper, but you can see they have similar morphology to both astrocytes and microglia um, with their, their processes as well. But all of these things we can use to determine essentially what's going on in the tissue. And so when we combine all of that together, we have um, surgical neuropathology. So we take all of those skills and things that we just talked about and apply it to real cases. So I'll pause here for questions before I get into an example. I don't know if there's any questions, but it feels like a good place to pause. Yeah, so this is a juicy question. I'm curious about your answer. Oh um, whose opinion about brain tumors is more accurate, a neuropathologist's or a neurosurgeon's? A neuropathologist. Because neurosurgeons, even like especially really experienced neurosurgeons, can probably make educated guesses about tumors based on their location and, you know, the way they look and things like that. But fundamentally, neuropathologists make the final call on what type of tumor it is. Um, so at the end of the day, if they're deciding between, you know, if they disagree, it's fundamentally the neuro, neuropathologist's call because they have the, the training and expertise to determine the type of tumor. Yeah, cool. I have a few questions, but I'll save them for the end. So please okay. go. Okay, so, but that's also not to say that neurosurgeons are not important and their opinions are not valuable because they are. Um, just at the end of the day, um, it would really come down to the neuropathologist. So we're going to all put on our pathologist hats and we're going to practice being a pathologist, um, recognizing that this is an example and we're not medically trained and all of the caveats that come with that, but we're just going to pretend for this case. Um, so this is a 45 year old man who goes to the ER complaining of a persistent headache and nausea that hasn't gone away for weeks. Um, so this is an MRI and there are about 10 different things. I, I'll just kind of walk you through it. So I'll, I'll give away the answers, but this is, this is the lesion. Um, so to orient you, these are your eyeballs. So this is the front of the head. This is your cerebellum and brainstem. So this is the back of your head. Um, and this big white blob does not belong. It should not be there. It should, the rest of your brain should look like this. It doesn't look like that. Um, so there are about 10 different things that could cause this. And the treatments would range from treating with steroids to doing nothing, depending on what this lesion is. And that's fundamentally why neuropathology is so important because if you have a lesion and you go in and you try to remove it, and let's say it's a, a cyst full of parasites, you could release all those parasites into the brain if you pop the cyst. Whereas if it's a tumor, you know, maybe you want to gamma radiate it instead. Um, so that's why pathology becomes so important. But so we have this lesion. So we take a biopsy of this lesion um, and it's sent to the pathologist department. And basically what they do is they take a little tiny piece of this biopsy. They put it on a slide. They put a second slide on top and they slide the two slides in opposite directions. And that's what we call a smear. And so that's where you can kind of look at the architecture of the cells. And so here we can see this is very densely nuclear. Um, there's a lot of nuclei. It's very atypical because the cells vary in size and shape. They look kind of ugly, which is sad, but true. They look kind of ugly. Um, and they have these processes. We call this a fibril look. Um, they have these processes. And all of this together suggests to us that this is a tumor of glial cells. Um, so we can tell kind of the different categories would be like a neuronal tumor or a neuronal um, derived tumor, a glial derived tumor, or um, uh, like a um, meningeal tumor or things like that. So this, based on this look, we could tell that this is probably glial. Um, and because they have these fibril processes, it's atypical with the, the number of cells and the size, um, and they're irregularly shaped. This is likely a type of tumor or glial tumor called an astrocytoma. But to confirm this for sure, we do what's called an H&E permanent. So what they do is they take the rest of that biopsy and they fix it in formaldehyde or formalin. And then they cut sections of it and do an H&E, which we talked about earlier, looking at cellular architecture or morphology. Um, so we can see here that this is densely cellular, again, very atypical looking cells. There's lots going on. And so for context, this is white matter. This is what normal white matter looks like. Um, so you can see there's a couple cells here and there. They look relatively similar in size because similar types of cells hang out. Um, our sample is not 
like that at all. Our sample is very different. So this again suggests that this is a tumor and not normal tissue. And then finally, we can do immunohistochemistry to confirm that it's an astrocytoma or a tumor of astrocytes by doing a GFAP stain. And we see here that the tumor is very, very positive for GFAP. That's all this brown staining you can see here. So that helps us kind of confirm that our final diagnosis is an astrocytoma, which is a cancer of glial cells. So we used a lot of different clues. Again, we're detectives. So we looked at the lesion on the MRI. We knew something wasn't right. We did the smear and we saw that there were cells of different sizes and shapes. Um, we saw the processes that fibril look, and then it was atypically cellular on H and E. So all of that suggested this astrocytoma tumor. Um, so in practice, in a real scenario, this could be diagnosed based on the H and E alone, uh, but the GFAP staining can help you confirm that it is in fact an astrocytoma, but the H and E is enough for a diagnosis. And the treatment for this type of tumor is aggressive intervention with resection and radiation, doesn't have a great prognosis um, depending on the grade, but the average is about 13 months. So once we knew what type of tumor is, that really helped dictate the treatment um, that the patient would need. And the grade, which again, tells you a lot about prognosis. So that is fundamentally why pathology is so important. If you just took it out and hoped for the best, that might not be the best, um, the best treatment option for the patient. That's what we're here to help determine. And then I'll go through one more scenario. I'm sure there will be questions after this. Um, so that was surgical pathology. So again, living patients, taking a biopsy, figuring out what type of tumor or lesion that they have. Now we're gonna flip to autopsy neuropathology. So these are deceased patients. They're patients that have died. Um, and we want to know what um, the cause of disease, was, uh, the cause of death was. So sometimes these can be um, because the medical examiner wants us to review them. So if they have a suspicion or they're unsure if the brain contributed to the cause of death, they can have a neuropathologist look at um, the brain and determine whether or not that played a role. Sometimes these can also be family consent. So these are families that want answers about what their loved one was suffering from. And so they will consent to have an autopsy performed, um, either a whole autopsy or a brain only autopsy to find out what happened to them. Um, and then individuals who donate their brain to any brain bank, but um, I can speak from our brain in particular, our brain bank in particular, this is free. So in exchange for donating their brain tissue for research purposes, um, the family is provided with a neuropathology report that tells them what their loved one died from or what disease they had, at least in their brain. So, and then trigger warning, Again, these are deceased patients, so you're going to see some pictures of brains. Nothing bloody. These are all thick brains, but just so you know. Okay, so um, the case we have here is an 80-year-old man who presents to his neurologist with difficulty remembering things, a shortened attention span, and increased confusion. Several years later, he dies, and his family requests an autopsy to determine the final diagnosis. Um, so on the, the left, we have a picture of a normal brain or a control brain, a normal brain. On the right, this is our case. And so you can see here that the brain is very atrophic. So the spaces between the gyri are larger than they should be. Here you can see the gyro pattern where the folds are very tight together. Here there's a lot more space, um, particularly in, in these areas back here um, in the frontal lobe. And then this kind of webby looking stuff, those are the meninges. That's a, a layer of basically protectin over the brain. And so if you peel that back, you can see again that this brain is atrophic. Now I will say all brains, when you remove the meninges look slightly atrophic. Um, the meninges help kind of fill in the gaps that make brains look more um, tightly packed, I guess. Um, but this one is particularly atrophic. You can see just how large these spaces are. They shouldn't be this large. Um, and that's that. So we can also look at gross pathology um, in the individual sections. So again, here's a normal brain at about the same level. And we talked about this earlier. You can see huge and large ventricles. This is the size the ventricle should be. And this is the size of our case. So you can see that it's just gigantic. And you can see there's really not a lot of white matter in this area. Um, and that's due to the tissue shrinkage. So the ventricles are enlarging because the tissue in this area, the cells are dying and it's causing the tissue to shrink compared to look at all how much white matter we have here. Um, and again, in the cortex as well, you can see enlarged spaces like here um, and a lot of thinning of, of the white matter. 
So when we look at the pathology on this, we see beta amyloid plaques. Um, so these are what we would call kind of diffuse plaques. They kind of have this like smushed appearance. I don't know a better way to describe it. Um, and then you have neuritic plaques. And what's interesting about neuritic plaques is they're both beta amyloid and tau positive. Um, and the reason is because neurons that have a lot of buildup of tau proteins in their processes, they get swollen with this tau protein and we call those dystrophic neurites. Um, so we see that here, this is a neuritic plaque that has these dystrophic neurites in it. So beta amyloid and tau are the two diagnostic hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. So if we have um, beta amyloid plaques, we have neuritic plaques that have tau dystrophic neurites in them. And then we have tau neurofibrillary tangles inside neurons. So beta amyloid is outside extracellular, tau is intracellular. This is diagnostic of Alzheimer's disease. And we use different um, scales to determine the severity. So this is not the severity again of symptoms, but the severity of the pathology. And so we can determine how far the beta amyloid protein has spread from the cortex to the brainstem. That helps give us one kind of scale how many of these neuritic plaques there are in a given area, that gives us another scale, and then um, where the tau tangles spread, that gives us a third scale. And so we use all of those together on a chart to tell us the severity, either mild, intermediate, or severe Alzheimer's disease. And so um, interestingly, the amount of tau pathology and the spread of tau pathology best correlates with disease severity when you think about symptomology. So the more tau and the further the tau has spread, the more severe the cognitive decline or memory impairment is, which is why I think tau is the most interesting protein to study. But again, I'm super biased because that's literally what I do in my lab. Um, so final diagnosis here, Alzheimer's disease, we looked at um, the clues, so atrophy, the ventricles were enlarged, the cortex was atrophic, um, you can also see again hippocampal atrophy, although the sections I showed you didn't have hippocampus in them, um, but the requirements, so these are, um, these are important important to look for, but are not diagnostic of Alzheimer's disease. You have to have beta amyloid staining in at least the cortex, tau staining in at least the entorhinal cortex, that's the cortex right near the hippocampus, um, for tangles and at least one neuritic or tau positive plaque, and then it has to be negative for other pathology. Um, with the caveat that you can have mixed dementia, which is two or more different types of disease processes or pathologic disease processes co-occurring, um, the most common being Alzheimer's disease and Lewy body dementia. So a lot of times you will see both pathologies present in, in a brain. Um, and then finally, I'll just really touch quick on my research because I think we're getting close to our, our end of time here, or we're actually might be over time. I'm so sorry if we are over time. Um, but basically, uh, my research, so uh, like I just mentioned, tau is really important in Alzheimer's disease. It also causes other diseases. We talked about frontotemporal lobar degeneration like way, way, way in the beginning of the presentation. Um, so there's a group of diseases, frontotemporal lobar degeneration with tau that are caused by the tau protein. And so Essentially, my research is trying to understand um, astrocytic tau pathology. So astrocytes only have tau pathology in neurons, but other diseases, particularly super, uh, progressive supranuclear palsy or PSP, have tau in astrocytes in addition to neurons. And so my research is trying to understand why one disease has protein buildup in astrocytes and the others do not. And so um, I think this is really critical to understanding the pathogenesis or how um, disease process is happening in progressive supranuclear palsy um, because it's unique to this disease. So I think that the um, buildup of tau protein prevents astrocytes from functioning properly, which in turn causes neuronal death. And then you have a non-functioning area of the brain if you have um, astrocytes that aren't working and neurons that aren't working as well. Um, so I think that astrocytic pathology is really important to disease. And my thesis defense coming up in a month, a little over a month, um, will kind of detail more about the research that I did over my PhD to kind of better understand this process. And so with that, thank you so much for being here today. I'm sorry I went a little bit over time. I think we started a little bit late. Um, please feel free to connect with me on social media. My handle is the path PhD on everything, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, although I really just use TikTok to post my Instagram videos. So just follow me on Instagram instead. Um, but that's the same. You can find me on LinkedIn. That's my email address. If you have any questions, 
please reach out. I love to help people get into this career path. I'm, I love to talk about my experiences and I love to teach. Um, so please feel free to connect if you have any questions. And with that, I will take any, any last questions. Thank you so much, Kimberly. That was awesome. And I really enjoyed uh, playing detective at the end as a yes. person who doesn't typically engage in neuropathology type of work. Um, you're getting a lot of thank yous in the chat. Oh, you're so welcome. I normally have like a quiz. It's kind of like, you know, those like choose your own adventure stories. It's kind of like that to like work through a case. Um, but then you have to like have learned a little bit about the pathology before you can like do it on your own. Um, so next time I, I have one of those. It's pretty cool. Awesome. Um, okay. We do have a question here. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Thinking about Alzheimer's specifically, do you take into account resilience of patients when studying samples, meaning the patients that do not present with dementia, but have plaques? So that's a really good question. Um, so you can see patients that don't have clinical dementia, but do you have pathology? Um, we don't, we do and don't take that into consideration. So if you have a little bit of pathology in a patient that doesn't have dementia symptoms, you will still report the pathology, um, but there won't be like, it will just be like, we all happen to see this pathology, um, but the pathology alone is not sufficient enough to explain any problems. Um, in the case where you do have dementia, you have to have enough pathology to explain the dementia symptoms, if that makes sense. So if you have a mild Alzheimer's case that's considered mild based on the pathology, that is not sufficient to describe dementia. So you'd have to look for another explanation for dementia. So some other kind of co-occurring pathology is most likely. Um, so it kind of works in one direction where it's important in looking at whether or not the pathology is sufficient to describe experience or dementia symptoms, um, but it's not always a, the other way around. So if you have no dementia symptoms, but you see pathology, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's one of these processes occurring. Like I said, mild Alzheimer's disease, pathologically considered, is not sufficient to display, explain dementia. So you could have mild pathology in a cognitively normal patient. Cool. Great answer. Thank you so much. Um, there's another question in the chat. What does your everyday life look like as a pathologist at the moment? Ooh, that is a super great question. Um, so right now it looks like a lot of thesis writing, um, but when I'm not thesis writing in a normal day, um, for me, because I'm also a bench scientist and I do research, I don't work as a clinical pathologist. I don't diagnose disease in patients. Um, a typical day looks like for me feeding my cell cultures um, or running an experiment with my cell cultures to look at some process with tau, um, staining human tissue. So um, looking at different proteins that could interact with tau in tissue. And then also um, I help out a lot with our brain bank. So that can be cutting donated brains that can be um, assessing or working up a case, we call it. So looking at the pathology that's present in the um, tissue and then creating or coming up with a diagnosis and an explanation for all of the pathology that we see um, in that patient that then gets approved by a pathologist. Um, and so once I graduate, I will be doing a lot more of that and a lot less bench science, um, but hopefully I will kind of be able to do still a little bit of both um, when I graduate as well. But that's kind of what a typical day looks like. Cool. Um, I have a few other questions. Yeah, of course. One thing, you in the very beginning, you mentioned how you went and did a master's before a PhD because you were kind of exploring and you were learning about what you wanted for your career. Uh, and I, I wanted to ask, how did that experience sort of fare for you? Did you did you feel that you learned from your master's? If you could go back, would you have gone right to a PhD? Like what are the pros and cons of that, that decision? Yeah, that's a really great question. So for me personally, it was 100% the right decision for me. Um, I learned so much in my master's degree. Um, I came in with so little knowledge about um, cellular molecular biology. In fact, I didn't even take a cellular molecular biology class before I started grad school. So I needed that time to really learn a lot of the basics. Um, and also I had done research, but doing a 10 week internship is not the same as doing research as a full-time career. And I think 10 week internships are fantastic for learning about if you even like bench science, but fundamentally 
doing science as a full-time career is a, such a different experience because you're there all day, every day. Um, and it's your job to do that. Whereas with an internship after 10 weeks, you know, you go on back to school or you do something else. Um, and so I think it was, it was really good for me to have that experience of working full-time in science to make sure it was the right career for me. Um, and also that I could just handle grad school. I came into grad school with the impression that master's degrees were fundamentally different than PhDs. Like they took different classes, they did different types of research and it's not. It is just a shortened version of a PhD, but you take all the same classes. You are doing the same level of research. You're just doing a smaller project so that you can finish in two years or three years, but you're not fundamentally doing research differently or using like different lesser techniques or anything like that. So I had like a false impression of what a master's degree would look like or be and thought it would be like a lesser experience. And that's not the case at all. Um, so it was really important for me to learn that. And I think I just learned how to be a better scientist, at least in the beginning. And then I made a lot of mistakes in the first year of my PhD and then learned again how to be a better scientist. So it was really a huge growth period for me. Um, and recognizing that despite my limitations because of my mental health, I could still do this as a full-time career. It just might look differently for me than it does for other people that don't have mental health struggles. So all of that is to say that I would absolutely go back and do it again. It was 100% the right decision for me. It's not for everyone, but it was absolutely the right one for me. Awesome. And um, by the way, since you stayed at Iowa for your PhD, that then means that your the classes you took in your master's like subtracted from those you had to take in your PhD, right? Yes. Yeah. So that's, that's it. I only took one class in my PhD because I was supposed to take it on my master's degree. I tried to take it my first semester and I was failing. So I dropped out. Um, and it just, I didn't have the background knowledge to be successful in that class at the time. So I took a replacement class and then three years later came back and passed for my PhD. And so everything after that first semester was just um, research-based. I didn't have any courses after that. Awesome. Yeah, that's great for just for everyone to know is when you join a master's or a PhD program, you spend the first year or longer doing all classes but so in Kimberly's case she did a master's took classes and then transitioned into a PhD so there's no classes left to take so um you can get through a PhD faster and focus on research yeah and for me if I hadn't been so close to finishing my master's degree I would have just transitioned into a PhD program and not finished my master's However, I was literally at the end, like I was writing my thesis up as they were creating the, mass, the, the PhD program. So it didn't make sense not to finish my, my terminal PhD. Um, otherwise I would have just transitioned and then expanded on my master's program for my PhD. But fundamentally I was done. I was done with my master's. So I finished that project and then started a brand new project for my PhD. So depending on like your institution, you may have to do something similar. You may be able to just transition into a PhD program and just make your program or your your research last longer for the the whole time. Yeah. Awesome. Someone commented, by the way, gross, the word gross is German for big and large. So maybe some German scientists in the field of pathology coined that term gross pathology. Yes. That's absolutely probably how it is. Um, I, I wouldn't be surprised at all if, if that was the case, because a lot of the um, pathologists who coined terms were um, obviously not American. Um, the first, the father of modern, or of I want to say it's like modern pathology was like Rudolf Virchow, who I don't know what his nationality was, um, but that wouldn't surprise me at all. That makes total sense. I just wish we as Americans didn't hear the word gross and think ew, because then it gets confusing. Um, but thank you for that. That's a really good fact to know for um, the future. Yeah. Um, I have one more question that yeah. we, unless another question comes in that we can close on. Um, sorry for the noise. So you talked a bit about how there's only one sort of consultant for neuropathology at your university. And it got me thinking, I mean, at most universities, there's, there are cores, they're called, and it's like, a, and I'm just telling this for the student members, there's, there'll be like a microscopy core or like a genetics core where you can bring your samples and you can have these people who work there do analysis and stuff. And whether it's microscopy or sequencing or whatever. Um, so my question to you, Kimberly, is do you think that every university or more universities should have a neuropathology core? Yes. And so a lot of them 
have pathology cores, but they're mostly like histopathology cores. So you have your samples processed and stained by someone else, and then you are relied on like doing the interpretation, um, which is really important. And some places, particularly with brain banks, do have neuropathology cores. So like at our university, it is a core facility that has brain banking, it has consulting services, and it has transcriptomic services. Um, but I absolutely think it's important that every university has these um, access to these resources because fundamentally, um, if you're working with an animal model of a disease and you don't know what the disease looks like in human, there's no way for you to know whether or not your model is right or it's working properly. Um, so it's really, really important, even if you're not doing neuropathology research at all, you're doing very basic neuroscience research, but in the context of some diseased model system, you need a neuropathologist to help make sure you're looking at the right stuff. Um, I also strongly believe that all neuroscientists should have basic neuropathology training. I'm not saying like this whole extensive stuff, like that's way more than you need to know, but like a basic understanding of like an H&E and like, what can you tell from an H&E? Like if you're doing IHC, like what do common things that people in neurodegenerative disease pathology look for? So like, what does tau look like? Beta amyloid, TDP 43, alpha synuclein, whatever else. Um, and so I'm working on building one of those someday at my university, but I really hope that that's an available, um, class or coursework for other universities because I think all neuroscientists would benefit from that so that you have a context of what things look like in in humans even if you're not looking at a human model. I completely agree um, and we have one last bonus question just for fun. What was your hardest class during your PhD program? Oh it was a hundred percent my cellular molecular biology class like a thousand percent like my brain just doesn't I was just thinking about this the other day because I went to my seminar class and I heard a phenomenal presentation um, from another student and all of the other students in the class were talking about some immunology concept and all of them understood what they were talking about and I had no idea what they were talking about I could not follow in the slightest um, because my brain just doesn't remember those kinds of things like all the immunology pathways and the types of different cells um, and the very nitty-gritty of like translation and transcription all those things like my brain just it just can't remember those things. Um, a lot of that's from bipolar, um, having memory problems, but also I took lithium in college and that gave me really bad memory problems. And so I'm still really not all there with my memory a lot of times. Um, so that class was so hard for me. Um, also because it was during COVID and it was online. It was like the first time the class was being offered online. So that was really difficult as well because it was fundamentally different format than what I had taken and dropped my first semester of grad school. Yeah. Oh, that's brutal. I also struggled with the molecular biology. I think I, none of the classes were easy. They were all definitely unfortunate to take. Um, okay. We did get one more question. That is a really good one um, for both of us. I'll please answer first though. What do you think is the most important tip for a neuroscientist going to, who's going to do a PhD? I think the most important tip is to recognize that neuroscience is so, so, so broad and you're never going to learn all of it. Um, one of the things I really struggled with in grad school was that I had a neuroscience bachelor's degree, but I couldn't remember or describe concepts like action potentials or understand a, like e -phys, like all of those concepts because they were so far removed from what I was doing in my PhD program that I just kind of forgot those things. Um, and then I felt like a terrible neuroscientist because I was like, oh, all neuroscientists should remember all of these things and know all these concepts. But that's really not the case. Fundamentally, your PhD is going to be a very, very, very small part of neuroscience. And if you're not constantly interacting or using all of those other areas of neuroscience, it might be harder for you to remember or harder for you to understand. And that's totally okay. And that doesn't make you any less of a neuroscientist, doesn't make you any less um, valid. And it, it doesn't mean that you're not doing it right or that you're behind or anything. It's just, that's the purpose of doing a PhD is to specialize in such a small topic that you, you can't possibly know everything that everyone else is working on, which is why I don't, you know, I try not to comment on, you know, neuropsychiatric conditions and that kind of research, because that's not what I do. That's completely different. And even like symptomology and like the um, like clinical implications of the neurodegenerative diseases we study and, you know, people looking at like MRI and like PET imaging and all those kinds of things. Again, very outside of my area. So I don't comment on those things because I don't know. And I, I don't want to be 
giving out the wrong information. And it's totally fine that I don't know because there are people out there that don't know anything about neuropathology. So it kind of works in, in both of those ways. Totally. And yeah, my answer is very similar, at least in the same sort of vein, um, that to basically like, don't be afraid of what you don't know and like embrace it. I think there, especially when you're coming out of like, you're going from senior year of college or like finishing up a master's and then starting a PhD, you're going from like big fish to little fish. And it's, it's very easy to get caught up in, uh, like a level of pride of someone asks you like, Oh, do you know about this? And you're just like, yeah, of course, like I know, but you don't actually know. And you have to just kind of drop all that pride and accept and get used to the the feeling of admitting, I don't know something, please explain it to me. You know, because if you if you pass up on those opportunities to ask for an explanation, you will get much less out of your education than if you always ask people who know better to explain something to you. And so that's something that you kind of have to learn and uh, and definitely offers a lot of value as sort of a skill. It's just humility, you know. Yeah. And definitely also being able to say, or like not being afraid to say, I don't know, but I'll look into that more. Um, particularly during my comprehensive exam, that was really, really hard for me was that they asked questions I didn't know. And that was the purpose. Like the goal was to get to a point where they asked me questions where I didn't know the answer. But after I finished my comprehensive exam and I passed, instead of celebrating, I went to my PI's office and I cried hysterically. Um, because all I cared about or could think about was the questions I got wrong. And when I, he asked me like, well, what did you get right? I couldn't remember a single question. All I was focused on was what I got wrong and how stupid I felt because I didn't know the answers, but like, it's okay to say, I don't know. That's something I'm going to look up. And that's exactly what I did. So I told my committee, I don't know the answer to that question, but that's something that I can look up. And then afterwards I did, I went and looked it up so that I could be better prepared for next time. Um, but it makes you feel really stupid in the beginning. If you don't know the answer to someone's question, but I started to realize that nobody knows the answer to every question. So being able to say, I don't know, and I'll look into that further, um, I think is a really important, like, maybe not skill to learn, but it's like a really important milestone to like get over in grad school. Is that like, it's okay to say you don't know and that you're going to look it up. Totally. And I think a lot of people like the general public tends to think of a PhD as like just spending four or six years learning everything about a topic and you come out of it knowing everything, but it's actually not the case. A PhD is really just learning how to identify everything that you don't know and then find the answer using the tools that and experience that you gain through the education. Uh, that's and that's the funny thing. Like on podcasts, I'm not sure if you have experienced this, Kimberly. People ask me questions about everything. And I'm just like, I don't know. I don't know at all. Even perfectly here, like I got a lot of questions about tumors. I I, I don't know a lot about tumors. I mean, I I know a little bit here and there, but like there are people who do their whole PhDs in in a, in a brain tumor. So like it's yeah, very much the same concept. And PhDs are not really meant to teach you knowledge about your subject. I mean, they are, but fundamentally they're to teach you how to, like you said, find answers about what things you don't know. Um, so that's, I think, another important thing to focus on when doing a PhD is that the goal is not to become an expert in every single topic or even your topic, but the goal is to learn how to find people who are experts in the things you don't know and work with them. Yeah. Well, thank you everyone for your questions. Kimberly, thank you so much for your fantastic presentation. I truly enjoyed it. Um, for everyone here and for those who are going to watch later on YouTube, um, how can people find you and, and connect with you? Yes. Hello. Um, so Instagram is like the most common place to find me or like the best way to find me. Um, so that's the path PhD, like the path as in pathology. I'm so clever. PhD. Um, you can also find me on Twitter under the same thing or my email. Thank you. Um, my email is also a, a great way to email like or connect with me. I'm very, very good about checking my email. Not so good about checking LinkedIn. So definitely email me instead. And I just put it in the chat. It's Kimberly dash Fioc, my first dash last name at U Iowa, like the University of Iowa dot edu. Awesome. And Kimberly, separately, um, not while this is recorded, I'm going to need your address because I want to send you one of our Ask Mugs. Oh, that's so cute. Thank you. Yeah, yeah we're not going to put that on YouTube. People don't even know where I live. <laughs> yeah, send me your address right now. No. <laughs> but yeah, thank you so much. And um, everyone, thank you for joining, for asking such great questions. And uh, I'm going to end the recording.